addition, if you insist on dependency preservation for efficiency, is to use third normal form, which allows some redundancy. But all functional dependencies can be checked. Um, well, to be specific, not all 3 NF relations are decompose, uh, dependency preserving, but we can get for any schema, any set of functional dependencies, we can get a 3 NF decomposition which is dependency preserving. That is the main point. There is always a lossless joint dependency preserving decomposition into 3 NF. So, just to remind you, what is the difference between BCNF and 3 NF? The difference is each attribute A in beta minus alpha is contained in a candidate key for R. That is the extra condition. So, if you um, let me go back here, um, if I uh, take this condition j k goes to L, it is a super key, no problem. If I take L goes to k, it is not a super key, it violates P C N F. But hey, there is a third condition for 3 N F, which says every attribute on the right hand side is contained in a candidate key, there is at least one candidate key. It turns out k is the only attribute on the right hand side and there is a candidate key j k, which contains k. So, k is part of some minimal key and therefore, this schema j k l does not violate 3 N F. If you apply the first test, it passes directly. If you apply the second test, the third clause, the escape clause that the attributes on the right hand side are part of a candidate key says that this one is ok, it is in 3 NF. Therefore, we will not decompose it and we will let it stay as is to and that ensures dependency preservation in this case. Okay, so, that was um, the idea of 3 NF. Uh, now, let us um, see a realistic example corresponding to the artificial example we had. Uh, let us say that we have a relation called department advisor, which basically says that look a student may be taking cor uh, you know courses in multiple departments, maybe they are taking multiple degrees, uh, multiple departments. So, there is a notion of a dual uh, degree in some universities, where you get um, let us say B E in two different branches or a B E and an M S C or whatever combinations are there. So, in each department you may have an advisor and let us say there is a department advisor, student ID, department name and instructor ID. Now, maybe the constraint is that in a department a student can have at most one advisor. Therefore, um, student ID department name functionally determines instructor ID, that is one constraint. Furthermore, let us say that instructors are in only one department, you do not want instructors to belong to two departments. Therefore, instructor ID determines department name. This is exactly the same structure as what we saw before. J k goes to L, L goes to k. That is identical to what we saw. So, for the same reason, if you take this particular one and decompose it, you will not preserve dependencies. If you keep it as is, dependencies are preserved. And in fact, it is kind of natural to say if I want to track, you know, who is the instructor. Uh, advisor for a student in the department, it is very natural to keep this relation. But of course, it is redundant because instructor ID function determines department name. So, there is some apparent uh, redundancy here. So, if I decompose, I will land up with two relations. One is instructor department, the other is student instructor, which is fine. I will have a student with two instructors. But to ensure that a student has only one advisor in a department, I have to join it back. So, I join the student instructor relation with the instructor department relation. On this join result, I have to make sure that for each student, each department there is at most one advisor. If it is violated, then the functional dependency is violated. Okay. And this relation as is, is in 3 NF. So, this again uh, shows an example of redundancy in 3 NF. Um, so, what we have here is um, this, uh, as I said, 
if you look at the where is that yeah l goes to k j k goes to l l goes to k so if i have a relation here l goes to k if l1 appears three times k must be the same each of those times so that is the redundancy and there's one more issue if you do not decompose um, if i want the relation of l to k um, and if i want to store it here i'll end up with a null value what does that mean what that means is if i have um, that uh, instructor is associated with a department if i don't store it separately what do i get if i have to use this relation to store which department an instructor is in but perhaps that instructor does not advise any student then the only way to represent it is to add a null here and so i will store l2k2 and j which is the student is null so that's a drawback also if, if i did not so i did not decompose this because it is in 3nf but on the other hand because i did not decompose it i am forced to use null values to store the instructor department mapping okay so that is the redundancy that's a drawback of 3nf so it has benefits has drawbacks now how do you test if a particular schema satisfies 3nf it turns out testing it is itself uh, expensive it's np hard well that is not a big deal by itself uh, anything you do with functional dependencies very often turns out to be np hard it's exponential uh, number of combinations but uh, it turns out you can ensure 3nf in one of two ways one is you take a relation check dependencies and decompose decompose repeatedly till you achieve 3nf but there is no guarantee if you do this that the resultant decomposition is dependency preserving and the whole point of 3nf was to ensure dependency preservation so this is a bad idea uh, i've seen a lot of students think that to do 3nf you simply start with a relation and start decomposing and that's the right way to achieve 3nf that's a useless way to achieve 3nf in general because you may not achieve dependency preservation what we want is a dependency preserving decomposition and there is an algorithm for this which we are going to see coming up and it's no based on a notion of a canonical cover and what is interesting is this whole algorithm runs in polynomial time even though even just checking if something is in 3nf is np hard this guarantees the result is in 3nf but takes only polynomial time okay so now uh, to understand what is a canonical cover basically um, as we saw given a set of functional dependencies you can infer others now i start with f i infer some more i add it to f it's not minimal if i remove those the uh, closure is still the same so canonical cover basically is based on the idea of somehow minimizing unnecessary functional dependencies one way of minimizing is to take a functional dependency and see if the remaining ones imply this then throw it out completely because it's redundant it's implied by the other ones but it turns out you need to do more because you may have a dependency which you can't throw it as a whole but a part of it can be thrown out in effect and this idea of throwing out a part of a functional dependency is made explicit by the notion of extraneous attributes so as an example here given ab a goes to b b goes to c a goes to c i can throw out ac no problem but here's a more complex one um a goes to b b goes to c a goes to cd can i throw out a goes to cd i can't because uh d is not anywhere here i cannot infer a goes to d but a goes to cd can actually be broken up into a goes to c a goes to d so i can break it up and then i can throw out a goes to c that is one thing i can do um but it's actually trickier than that uh, here's another one which is a goes to b b goes to c a c goes to d now a c goes to d cannot be broken up any more so i may say well tough uh, nothing is redundant here i can't delete anything but actually i can uh and the idea is a c goes to d if i remove c it's actually okay what i'm doing is 
um, when I remove C from here and replace it by A goes to D, I am doing something quite the opposite of what I did before. Earlier, I threw out a functional dependency. Here, I am taking a functional dependency A C goes to D and replacing it by something which is stronger. A goes to D is making a stronger statement than A C goes to D. There are cases where A goes to D may be violated, but A C goes to D may be satisfied. So, this is stronger, but if A goes to D, certainly A C will go to D. So, A C goes to D is weaker. So, what I am doing here is replacing a weaker one by a stronger one. Now, I cannot do this arbitrarily, I may actually change the closure. So, I can do this only if the closure of the two is the same. So, what I have done is, I have simplified it by removing attributes. In this case, it is making it stronger, but in this case, it is actually ok, because a goes to d was actually implied by the remaining dependencies, um, by this dependence. So, from here, I can go get A goes to C. Therefore, given A, what is the closure? Using this, the closure includes A, B, C and then using A C to D includes D. The closure of A is includes A B C D. As a result, a goes to D is implied by these. So, I can actually replace a weaker one by a stronger one, but that reduces the number of attributes. So, the idea is I want to minimize the number of attributes in the functional dependencies. So, the canonical cover is a minimal set of functional dependencies having no redundant dependencies or redundant parts of dependencies. Okay. So, to continue, um, we have two parts to the definition of extraneity. An attribute A is extraneous in alpha, given a functional dependency alpha goes to beta in F. A is extraneous in alpha, that is on the left hand side. If F logically implies, I remove alpha goes to beta and replace it by alpha minus A goes to beta. So, I am taking something weaker, replacing it by something stronger. I can do this if this thing is actually implied by F. So, it is not really stronger. It appears stronger, but anyway I can infer it using the entire set of dependencies F. Okay, so, that is the definition of extraneous on the left hand side of a functional dependency. On the right hand side, extraneity is uh, symmetric. So, what I will say is A is extraneous in beta, that is the right hand side, if F minus alpha minus beta. So, what I am doing is I am replacing something stronger by something weaker. This is ok if the weakened set. So, what is the weakened set? The weakened one is I remove alpha goes to beta from f and add back alpha goes to beta minus a. This is the weakened set. If the weakened set logically implies the original set f, then I have not actually weakened it. It is still as strong. So, what I am doing in either case is one set is obviously weaker than the other. If I can show the weaker one implies the stronger one, then I have not actually weakened it, it is equivalent and therefore, I can drop that attribute. That is the idea. So, here is a coming back to our example, uh, A goes to C, A B goes to C. Uh, is B extraneous in this one? Yes, because um, this original set logically implies the result of dropping B, which is A goes to C. A goes to C can easily be derived from, um, uh, it is already there in fact. Um, so, I can drop B from here. Now, the other one, next example is uh, A goes to C and A B goes to C B. Those are the functional dependencies. Now, I want to see if C is extraneous in the right hand side here. So, supposing I drop C from here, the weakened one is A goes to C, A B goes to D. Now, from that, can I infer A B goes to C? Yes, trivially, because I already have A goes to C on this side. So, from A goes to C, I can infer A B goes to C. So, uh, I can infer back A B goes to C D. So, C is extraneous here. So, that is the idea. So, now, um, how do I do this test? I can do it each time by computing F plus and so forth. That is little painful. So, again using attribute closure, there is a simpler test. So, what I am going to do 
is I take any particular dependency alpha goes to beta. To check if a particular attribute a in alpha is extraneous, what I will do is I will compute alpha minus a, remove a from alpha, compute its closure using the original given set of dependencies f and check if uh, this plus contains beta. That means, uh, the original set of dependencies already implied the stronger condition that alpha minus a functionally determines beta, in which case a can be deleted and uh, you retain, you delete a from this and replace it by alpha minus a goes to beta. Now, for the other side, it is similar, but slightly different. Now, I am removing from the right hand side. So, what I am left hand side is not touched. So, I am going to compute alpha plus, but not using the original dependency set. Instead, I am going to use the weakened dependency, which is I am going to remove alpha goes to beta from f, add back alpha goes to beta minus a, and then I compute alpha plus using this weakened set. And if this alpha plus contains a, then I know I can anyway derive a from the remaining ones. So, a is extraneous in beta. So, this is actually a very simple test. In fact, it takes polynomial time, attribute closure is polynomial, polynomial number of attributes to be tested. So, I can very quickly apply this test blindly and keep deleting attributes from functional dependencies and quickly compute the canonical closure. So, your lab exercises today include several examples of computing the canonical closure, at least one example. So, here is another example of doing it. Um, this is the same one as before, but this time I am going to use the alpha plus computation instead of trying to infer functional dependencies in general. So, can I delete A from A C? I cannot. Can I delete C from A C? I cannot. Can I delete B from A B goes to C? Well, I will use this test. So, if I delete B, I have A left. Now, I have to compute A plus using the original dependency that is this one. So, using that, um, I can see easily that A plus uh, contains C, which is the right hand side here. Therefore, B is redundant, it is extraneous. I will delete B. What I am left with is A C A C. So, that is a duplicate. I will retain just A C. Okay, so, that was one case. Now, for the other side, the other example, last time we found that um, C is extraneous. Now, let us do the same thing with attribute closure. What do I do? I am going to remove A B goes to C D and add back A B goes to D. So, the dependencies I have are A C, A goes to C and A B goes to D. These are the two ones. Now, the left hand side is A B. I compute A B plus. A B plus on this is what? A goes to C. Therefore, A B plus includes A B C. Now, A B goes to D. Therefore, it also includes D. So, A B plus is A B C D. And A B plus now certainly consider contains the attribute which I just deleted, which was C. So, this test succeeds. Therefore, C is extraneous. I can remove C. So, what do I get? I get A goes to C and A B goes to D. That is the I cannot delete anything more. That is the canonical cover for this one. Okay. So, there is one more step in canonical cover. I remove all extraneous attributes and then the last step is each left hand side of a functional dependency in F C is unique. This is kind of trivial. What I do is after removing all extraneous attributes, if any two dependencies have the same left hand side, I merge them. That is the left hand side is the same, the right hand side is a union. So, that is a very simple union step. So, to compute the union uh, canonical cover, I uh, remove extraneous attributes, apply union and keep repeating this until nothing can be deleted and nothing can be unioned. That is it. So, there is another example of canonical cover. Um, so, we are kind of running out of time, but uh, let me go over this very quickly. So, first of all, given this set of dependencies, A goes to B C, B goes to C, A goes to B, A B goes to C. Can I apply union rule? 
Yes, the first and the third have the same LHS A. I union them to get A goes to B C. So, this is what I have now. Now, um, can I find anything extraneous? I am going to test um, in this one. Uh, a B goes to C. I am going to check if A is extraneous. So, if I, um, how do I check it? Well, I have to see if the stronger one B goes to C can be inferred. But in fact, it is already there. So, it is kind of trivial to delete A from here and then B goes to C is duplicate. So, I am going to get A goes to B C, B goes to C. Now, um, what else can I do on this? Is anything extraneous here? Let us see if B is extraneous in this one or C is extraneous actually, B is not. Let us check if C is extraneous on this one, A goes to B C. So, how do I do that? I will delete it and see if A goes to C is logically implied by the remaining ones. So, if I delete C from here and compute A plus, I will get A B and then from there C. So, I can infer C back. So, C is extraneous. So, what I get here is A B and B C. That is the canonical cover. So, what is the point of all this? The canonical cover is minimal, it has unique left hand sides and its closure is exactly the same as the original uh, relation or original uh, functional dependencies closure. So, now, which I, once I have achieved the canonical cover, the trick is I am going to use the canonical cover to construct a set of relations. Canonical cover can be computed very efficiently polynomial time. Once I have it, I will construct a 3 nf decomposition. So, how do I construct that decomposition? I am not going to start uh, and decompose one at a time. I am actually going to, uh, I, I took a uh, initial set of functional dependencies on the initial schema R, I assume it is just one relation. And using those dependencies, I am just going to construct a new set of relations. So, I will construct the canonical cover. Now, for each functional dependency in the canonical cover, by the way f sub c denotes the canonical cover. So, for each functional dependency in it, um, I will check if uh, the attributes in that one alpha beta are not already co contained in one of the existing schemas. And if they are not, then I will add it to the schema. So, I will add I 1 to i and make r i equal to alpha beta. So, in other words, for each functional dependency in the canonical cover, I am creating a corresponding relation. One extra step is I may have two uh, functional dependencies, one of which is completely contained in another. So, here I will not bother creating a separate relation for that, I will throw it out, that is the idea. So, that is the redundant relation removal. But here is one more thing, it is not enough to construct uh, a relation per functional dependency. As an example, let us say I have a schema A, B, C, D and D does not participate in any functional dependency whatsoever. So, in the canonical cover D will not appear at all, but D is there in the schema, what do I do about it? That is one possible situation. So, uh, in general, what I will do is make sure that one of these schemas at least contains a candidate key for R. Okay. How do I ensure that it contains a candidate key? Simple, I, for each of the schemas, um, I will do a closure and check if uh, all attributes are contained in the closure of the attributes of that schema. For at least one schema, the closure should include all attributes. If not, I have a problem. What do I do then? I will pick any candidate key for R and add that candidate key itself as a new relation, that is one extra relation. Okay. So, once I have done that, removed relations which are contained in others, I am done. So, that is the 3 nf decomposition. This is also called 3 nf synthesis algorithm, because if you notice, I just ignored whatever schemas were given and just took the dependency and came up with a schema from the dependencies. 
So, what does this algorithm ensure? We will not prove it formally here, but it can be shown that each R i is in 3 n f and furthermore, the decomposition is dependency preserving and lossless term, which is what we wanted. This is why we went to 3 n f from B C n f. Okay. So, um, here is an example of uh, B C n f uh, sorry 3 n f synthesis using a new schema called Cust Banker Branch which is kind of like the department advisor, slightly different. So, here I have customer ID, employee ID, branch name and type. The type is one extra attribute. And what we are going to say is that a customer will have an advisor or whatever in each branch that they are associated with. So, if I have accounts in two different branches, one of the employees of each branch is assigned as my personal banker, let us say, who will keep track of things connected to me. So, now, what are the functional dependencies in this schema? Um, so, first of all, uh, given a particular employee ID, each employee is in only one branch. So, employee ID goes to branch name. Then, customer ID branch name functionally determines employee ID. That is, given a customer, in a particular branch, they can have only one associated employee. And finally, I am also going to say that customer ID, employee ID determines uh, branch name and type. How did this come about? This kind of trivial because employee ID determines branch name and uh, type is something maybe, uh, you know, that you can decide whatever you want it to be, but let us say that um, a particular customer ID, employee ID pair, the advisor may, you know, maybe there is some extra field which says that this person is this type of advisor, financial advisor, some other advisor, but you can only have one advisor in a branch. That is the concept. A little artificial, but let us assume that. Okay. So, now this is the set of dependencies. Let us see if anything is extraneous. Um, now, you should have noticed that branch name here, we know, we, we can kind of infer it is extraneous because we already know employee ID goes to branch name. So, why include customer ID also here? You can do this more formally using the procedure we have, but it is easy to show that branch name is redundant, it is extraneous, we are going to delete it. And in fact, this is what we land up with, this schema, nothing more is extraneous. I'll skip the details for lack of time and then generate um, three relations corresponding to these three um, functional dependencies. Again, I am going very fast. Uh, do not worry if you are not keeping up. Please read it afterwards. So, what we need to do is check if at least one contains a candidate key. So, we do the closure. Um, which one of these has a closure? Uh, this one customer ID, employee ID type, its closure includes branch name. Therefore, it contains a super key. If it contains a super key, it will also contain a candidate key. So, we are done. And then finally, delete any redundant schema. So, if you take the second and the third relation, you can see that this is contained in this. Therefore, we will drop the second relation. So, the final 3 and F has two relations and one of them has a candidate key. So, that is it that is the 3 NF decomposition. So, to summarize, um, we would like to uh, get a dependency preserving lossless joint decomposition to BCNF. We cannot always do that. So, then we have a choice stick with BCNF or go with 3 NF. Practically speaking, um, a small note here, SQL does not actually support the ability to enforce functional dependencies. So, it is fine to say dependency preserving, but when you go into the real world with SQL, you cannot enforce the dependency. The only dependencies you can enforce are key value dependency. You cannot enforce anything else. Therefore, uh, to say that um, you know I have a dependency preserving decomposition, where one of the dependencies is not a primary key dependency, 
is useless, it cannot be enforced in SQL unless you put in triggers or whatever. Therefore, the model in the real world may be that dependency preservation is not that important. It is maybe better, anyway you cannot enforce it without doing more work. So, in many situations, maybe it is fine to just go with DCNF and forget about dependency preservation. On the other hand, sometimes you do want to store, you know, like the student department advisor. It is very natural to create a table to say, this student, this department, this is the advisor. Even though we know that this table is not um, in BCNF, we may still keep it because it makes sense to store it, uh, even though it is redundant. So, that is intuitive, it is not a theoretical reason, it is an intuitive reason why sometimes you may prefer to go with CNF. Okay, so that is, uh, this slide summarizes what I just told you. And to wrap up um, for now, uh, we have a uh, notion of multi-valued dependencies. And to understand that, here is an example. I have an instructor who has children, one or more children, and I am recording those children. I have an instructor who has phone numbers, so there are potentially multiple phone numbers. Now, supposing I take these two relations, which I am given, and I do a join, and for some reason I decide this is my schema, not the original relations, the combined relation is my schema. So, the combined relation is id, child name and phone number. On this relation, are there any functional dependencies? Does id functionally determine child name? It does not. Instructor can have multiple children. Maybe in China, with the one child policy in enforced, maybe it does, but even in China, there are multiple children and certainly not in India or in most other places. So, id is not going to determine child name. Is ID going to determine phone number? No, I mean most of us these days have multiple phones, a mobile phone, a landline at home, a phone in the office, so it does not. So, does child name determine phone number or phone number determine child or anything? Of course not. In fact, there is no functional dependency on this relation. If there is no functional dependency, is it in BCNF? Yes, trivially. Let me rephrase that. There are functional dependencies, but they are all trivial. There is no non-trivial functional dependency on this relation, and the trivial ones do not matter for BCNF. So, what we have just shown is this combined relation is in BCNF, but is it not redundant? Is that fine? No, you will notice that there is a lot of redundancy in this relation. It is very clear that you know, for the same instructor, I am storing the children twice and the phone numbers twice. That is pretty idiotic. So, intuitively it is clear there is redundancy here, but if I just apply BCNF, it says everything is okay. So, moral of the story is BCNF may not be the end of the story. There is more to life than just BCNF and this particular example shows what is called a multi-valued dependency. Con, you know, intuitively, even though phone number is not uniquely determined by ID, the phone numbers for an ID are completely orthogonal to the other other attributes in this relation. So, the phone numbers for an ID are completely independent of the child name. In fact, conversely, the children of an employee are completely independent of the phone numbers. Okay, so, even though ID does not functionally determine phone number, it multi-value determines phone number. So, this is a new concept of multi-value depending, not uniquely determining it, but multi-value determining it. So, that results in the notion of a multi-value dependency and we will write it in a notation as saying ID double arrow phone number. That is we say multi-value determines phone number. In other words, there may be many phone numbers with an ID, but the relationship of the two is independent of anything else in that relation. Okay? So, uh, once we have written these MVDs, multi-value dependencies, 
Um, there is actually a whole theory with multi-valued dependencies. We do not have time for that. In most courses probably would not have time to really get deep into it. But at least intuitively, if you recognize a multi-valued dependency like this, id goes to phone number, it is very intuitive. And what you do about it, you can decompose. Just like we decomposed using functional dependencies, we can take this multi-valued dependency, id goes to phone number and decompose. So, in our previous example, if somehow you started with this schema and you realize that id multi-value determines phone number, we decompose. What is the decomposition? id phone number, id child name, exactly like BCNF decomposition. The question is, is it lossless join? It is not a functional dependency, it is a multi-value dependency, but is the decomposition lossless join? And the answer, uh, we are not going to get into the details, but the answer is yes it would be lossless join and as a result, it is okay to decompose. So, we use functional and multi-value dependencies and then decompose using both of these to get a normal form which is called 4NF, which I have not shown here. Uh, I have not got into the details, but practically speaking, you most of the time, even without getting into the all the theoretical aspects of inferencing using multi-value dependencies, you just identify the multi-value dependencies, decompose and you are probably fine with that much. Okay, so, I am going to stop here uh, for the morning session. Okay, so, some of these questions were asked before the break, so I am going to skip them. Okay, so, I think I have skipped the only questions which were already answered. I uh, will take maybe a few questions. Let us see if anybody has their hands raised. My question is regarding ER diagram. Uh, when we are trying to build your assignment like a tutorial, at that time we are trying to model by using a ternary relationship that we get, uh, it involves the entities like train, station and schedule as a ternary relationship. So, is that, uh, is it possible that uh, in a Tandara relationship, one of the entity is a weak entity? Yes. So, both uh, it is hard for me to answer that question without seeing the ER diagram and so on. So, what I suggest is, uh, since this question is not concerned with today's lecture, please send that question by email, uh, you should have the email address. So, send it by email and I will answer it offline. If that question is of general interest, maybe we can even discuss it during the lab session. So, please send it by email, I am not going to answer that directly. Okay. Any other question? Please go ahead. Uh, what are the things uh, I must consider when I am decomposing particular relation? Uh, what are the things you must consider? So, as we just discussed in great detail, functional dependencies are the primary thing for decomposition. However, multi-value dependencies also do arise. So, occasionally uh, you will need to use them also and we just went over the whole theory. Now, if you interpret your question as if there are alternatives for decomposition, what do I do? How do I make a choice? Um, so, we already saw that with BCNF, we saw an example where there were two choices, one of which was dependency preserving, one was not. So, obviously, you would choose the one which is dependency preserving. So, you may want to, uh, at, at any stage, you may have multiple um, uh, functional dependencies which show violation and if one of them ensures dependency preservation using one of them and the other one does not, you would of course, pick the one which preserves dependencies. So, that is one consideration. Um, I can't think offhand of others. There probably are a few more. Uh, okay, my question is that in a normalization, we have atomic values, and uh, in a, uh, object-oriented database, we decompose the one relations and put some nested relations. Scenario: the, uh, the normalization is uh, better, and where we prefer the use of uh, object-oriented database. Over to you. Thank you. That is a good question. The question was, uh, the whole normalization theory which 
we have been using is based on atomic values. On the other hand, uh, there exists object oriented and object relational systems, which do not actually have atomic values, because they allow uh, sets and arrays and other such stuff. So, I guess there are two parts to the question. Uh, A is, uh, you may not have asked this explicitly, but implicitly, uh, is there a theory of normalization uh, once you have uh, non-atomic domains? And uh, I believe this has been addressed, uh, but uh, you know we have not covered it here. Uh, it's a little complex, uh, but if you're interested, perhaps you will find some material. But none of the textbooks that I know actually cover it. Uh, the other part, so the, is can normalization be theory be extended to deal with non-atomic values? So the other part is uh, of the question as I interpret it is, if we don't have normalization theory, then we have two alternatives: stick to atomic values, use normalization theory, or give up everything and use object-oriented principles. Uh, so how do you make this choice? Um, so now. Even if you use object um, uh, relational or object oriented systems, where some of the values are non-atomic, still most of the values are going to be atomic. And you can certainly use uh, functional dependency theory with those. Furthermore, uh, it, most of the cases which I have seen, when people use a set valued thing in an object oriented system, it usually corresponds to a multi valued dependency in normalization theory. So, for example, if a person had a set of phone numbers, uh, instead of creating a new relation which maps ID to phone number, they would create a multi-valued attribute phone number. But this actually corresponds directly to a multi-valued dependency from ID to phone number. So, you can actually apply the theory uh, pretty much unchanged using multi-valued attributes. So, just because you are using an object oriented database does not mean you have to again start everything from scratch. You can actually use the theory we have covered so far and handle almost all of the issues with, without doing anything more specifically. Uh, there are a few more issues. There is specialization, generalization. Um, now, there, if you recall, when we created relations from specialization and generalization, we landed up in some situations where there was redundancy across tables. So, we had two tables, each of which satisfies BCNF, but they repeat information. So, to remind you of that, uh, let us say there was a person table, then there was an employee and student table. Now, person had ID name, employee had ID name, which it inherited plus salary, student had ID name and credits. If I store the name redundantly in each of these tables, if somebody is uh, both a student and an employee, the name gets repeated in the two tables. Does this mean BCNF is violated? If you look at individual tables, um, it is not violated. BCNF is not violated, because ID is a super key and there are no other functional dependencies on individual tables. So, if you start with this schema, it looks like there is no redundancy. But as I told you before, uh, just because BCNF is satisfied does not mean there is no redundancy. In this case, there would be redundancy and that is a trade off. So, we all had the alternative schema, where I have a relation person uh, ID name, another relation employee ID salary, a third relation student ID credits. So, the employee and student relation do not store name and by not storing name, they avoid uh, redundancy. So, here is an example of redundancy, uh, which normalization theory would not have caught, but if you started with um, the, uh, uh, the ER model with specialization or you landed up at the same thing in an object oriented design with specialization, uh, then you can catch the redundancy there and avoid it without having to deal with uh, regular normalization theory. I hope that answered your question. Uh, back to you for any follow-up question. Thank you, sir. So nice of you. Back to you. Okay, we are now half an hour behind, so I think I will stop here, and uh, we will meet again at four fifteen.